Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy by John Allen Price Chapter 15 I suppose some forward bases are more primitive than others, said Alvarez, as she and Hunter entered the briefing room and discovered several computer monitors sitting in front of the wall screen. Don't you guys have repair crews? This building was heavily damaged in the last Mishima attack, answered Major Gaines, the base's intelligence officer. We just installed the display system but the Corps hasn't sent anyone to program it yet. At my base, we sometimes don't even have this, said the Special Forces Captain entering the room next. Scott Hogan gave a sneering glance at Hunter and Alvarez, then moved past them without even a perfunctory greeting. Come on, Hunter. If you can tolerate failure, you certainly can take this. Cheerful tonight, aren't you? said Hunter. Your reputation is well deserved, Hogan. I hope this attitude changes after your first cup of coffee. You'll have breakfast later, said Gaines. Take your seats and let's keep this civilized. Rogers joined Hunter and Alvarez moments later and with him came the main body of Special Forces officers. When they were all accounted for, the briefing room was locked and Gaines instructed each group to cluster around one of the monitors. As of 24 hours ago, this is what the area called the Citadel looked like, he began, then paused long enough for everyone to study the first image the screen showed. And here's what it looks like within the past hour. Taken by a long-range reconnaissance camera, the first was a desolate landscape with only a runway, a bare launch pad, and some service towers to mark the Dark Legion facility. The second image showed a massive building under construction. Its design had no symmetry. It appeared octagonal, but none of its sides were the exact same length or angle. Some looked like steeply sloped battlements. Others were huge staircases that led to gaping portals. Already giant statues were being erected in niches beside the portals and on every smooth surface, there were work details carving the rune-like characters of an alien language. The entire structure looked like a monstrous perversion of an ancient castle. The first responses to it were gasps of awe and fear. Are you sure this is the same site? Asked one of the other officers, recoiling in shock from what she saw on her screen. The very same, said Gaines at a slightly wider angle. If you'll notice the upper right corner, there's the launch pad and the service towers. How long before it's completed? Asked Hunter. We estimate another day. The trenches you see being dug around the Citadel will also be finished at that time. And you expect us to attack that thing? Hogan asked, incredulous. Why, it would take a full division of ground forces and every warplane we got on the planet to do so. That's the job for the forces being gathered at this and other forward bases, Gaines responded, and the airfields behind us. Your job is to neutralize as much of the Citadel's defense grid as possible to allow those forces to be effective. A tactical map replaced the nightmarish image of the uncompleted Citadel. It showed the layout of the site's outer defenses, which began just south of the low mountains that stood between the Citadel and Capital's frontier. The map not only had the positions of anti-aircraft artillery and missile batteries, but minefields, power lines, observation posts, and major sensor stations. I know it looks extensive, said Gaines, and it is. However, Based on our intelligence reports, and those from the Brotherhood and Mishima, the whole system is vulnerable to sabotage. The trick is to insert you into the outer perimeter undetected and make sure you stay that way. 
If I can sneak my men past Venusian rangers undetected, I can get him past those creatures. Hogan quickly declared. I hope you can, Captain. Now before I begin the detailed explanation of each squad's mission, I'd like to introduce you to your new members. Since this is the first time Capital has launched a major attack against a Dark Legion outpost on Venus, military advisors will be assigned to each squad. Something tells me I'm not gonna like who we get, Hunter groaned. And he had barely finished the warning when the main door opened. Into the darkened room filed a shadowy group of figures. None were immediately recognizable until one stumbled into a chair and sent it crashing against the others. Bungle. Well, I hope Sutter's with you. I'd sure hate if the team were broken up. Yes, my master. You wish to see the patient? Said Curator Precor. An obsequious laugh running through his question. What other reason would bring me here? Said Ragathal, standing in the entrance of the isolation chamber. Leave us. I wish to see the receptacle alone. The answer to Ragathal's orders was an extended giggle as Precor and his underlings moved out of the chamber while he strode in. Within seconds, only the Nephrite and Lorraine Coven remained in the chamber. The bed she was tied to this time was more comfortable than the one in the processing hall, and she did not have to endure the screams and cries of the other patients, only the soft buzzing and crackling of the computer-like necrotechnology machines lining the wall behind her. A cap of thick wires and two intravenous lines connected her to the life support system which kept her in a half-conscious, half-dream state. She opened her eyes when Ragathal spoke, and the system's blue and orange status lights registered an increase in her pulse rate and brain activity when he approached. Greetings again, receptacle, he said as he towered over Coven. I sense you're feeling much better, at least the part of you that can still feel. I've come to tell you, to enjoy these last few hours on your home world, because you'll soon be leaving it forever. You'll be my gift to he who must be obeyed and responsible for elevating me to more powerful circles in the Dark Legion. What do you think of that? The system's heart and pulse rate monitors registered Coven's response, and seconds after more of the lights began flashing, a few tears rolled out of her eyes. Carefully, Ragathal brushed one of his fingers over her face and caught some of the tears in his claw-like nail. Enjoy these as well, while you can, he warned. For soon, you won't have enough humanity left to even shed them. Precor, return and prepare the human for transport. I'll leave with her in a matter of hours. So these are the flamer grenades you guys claim you invented? Said a fire support specialist from one of the other special forces squads. He held the grenade gingerly, as if it would explode even though the safety pin and green safety flags were visible around its top. No, he didn't invent it, said Vanetti, stepping into the conversation Holston was having with his opposites. I invented it, and you can verify that with the SF training guys. Hey Ted, what's with the midget? Is he your boom guy or your mascot? Yeah, he's our explosive specialist. Halston replied, you got a problem with that? Now really, said Halston's new friend, it's just that the boom guys always seem to be short, pushy types. All right, I know a fight brewing when I hear one, said Hunter, bearing down on the group with Scott Hogan in tow. Save it for the Dark Legion. Right now, you still got work to do. And so do you, Bryant, Hogan added. I want everyone in their jet chutes before they board the Cutlass. You see, Mitch, every other squad on this operation is using jet chutes, said Bramble, trailing behind the officers at a safe distance. Why do you refuse them? 
because I prefer to use the anti-sensor technology in our new cutlass to insert us closer than the other squads will be, said Hunter, and have never lacked the jet shoot. Its infrared signature is too obvious for me. Well, whatever that signature is, it's certainly a lot smaller than what a cutlass will put out, Hogan sarcastically declared, and I don't care what fancy cloaking system your ship has. And I don't care that you don't care. Hunter's voice grew more belligerent with each word until he realized both Hogan and himself were building the same antagonisms their men had been displaying moments before. I've thought out my squad's part in this operation as carefully as you have yours. I know what my people are capable of, and a little nighttime hiking isn't unusual for them. Then we'll meet you at the Citadel, Hunter. I hope the hike will give you an appetite for combat. You'll need it. All right, Bryant, let's gather up the others. Mitch, I know we've had our differences, said Bample, after Hogan and the members of the other squads had left. But this mission is different, and I think you should be more flexible in your mission plan. Your entire squad was recently recertified on jet shoots. Changing to them shouldn't be that much of a problem for you. I get the feeling the real reason you want jet shoots is to cut down on the hike in, said Hunter. Just remember who you are, Bamble. You're an advisor, not a commander of the unit, and the plan won't be changed to make it easy for you. I want to enter the Dark Legion territory the most covert way possible, not the most popular or easiest way. So get ready for the hike. And one more thing. Don't call me Mitch. Squad commanders, may I have your attention, please? Gaines requested, his voice blaring over the hangar speakers. We're 20 minutes and counting to departure. Finish loading your helicopters and stand by for pre-start signal. Hunter and Bamble returned to their cutlass just as the rest of the squad finished boarding it and Alvarez completed her walk-around inspection of it. Of the four gunships that filled the hangar, theirs was the only one to appear in factory new condition, and not wear the three-tone camouflage of a combat machine. It wore the standard midnight blue prototype finish, though the high visibility fuselage markings had at least been removed. She checks out perfectly, said Alvarez, popping the canopy on the second cockpit. Not a single malfunction anywhere. We even managed to load all those extra munitions you wanted. Good. I got a feeling we'll be using them, said Hunter. If we don't melt our guns first, let us know when you get the departure command. Moments later, the last hatch slid shut on the last gunship, while the pilots and their navigator electronic warfare gunners did their pre-start checks. The hangar lights changed to soft red, to prepare everyone's night vision. And when the main doors started to slide open, they were extinguished. This is Threshold Tower to Special Forces Flights. The mission event clock will commence running in one minute, 27 seconds. You will be cleared for departure. Weather conditions are normal. Winds are out of the southwest at 14 kilometers. We're holding all traffic until you leave. After this, you'll need to acknowledge any further transmissions. From everyone here at Forward Base Threshold, good luck. The first helicopter to be towed from the hangar was Hogan's. Among the last to come out was Hunter's. It's rocking in its trolley, a little more pronounced due to its increased weight. All four machines were lined up on the apron in front of the hangar, and the first had its rotor blades turning before the last finished emerging. With its anti-collision and running lights flashing brightly, Hogan's cutlass lifted off its trolley and moved across the field. It climbed just high enough to clear the surrounding buildings, and its external lights remained on only until it cleared the base perimeter. Then they were extinguished, and the night swallowed the machine. The rest of the gunships departed the same way, fanning out on individual courses, but all heading due south where Venus's Aurora Australis undulated and sparkled brightly on the horizon. 
Behind them, the forward base was rapidly coming to life itself. Its arming service points were filled with AH-19 gunships, and its taxiways with Hercules IV transports. The soldiers in the barracks just beyond the airfield were also preparing for the operation, and would soon be marched out to the aircraft. Because of its short runways and its proximity to the frontier, there were no F-A-99 fighters at the threshold. They were marshalling at bases deeper inside capital territory, operating on their own timetable and awaiting the success of the special forces. There they go, Wood uttered somberly, watching the symbols for the four helicopters depart the forward base marker and spread across the tactical map. As each moved further into the territory, they started to flash and fade, indicating their radar returns were growing progressively weaker. Now it all depends on them. The other elements appear to be on schedule, Mr. Wood, said Hart, motioning to the readouts on the side screen. Shouldn't we hold everything on ground until the Citadel's defense nets start going down? That would be safer, but this attack needs split-second timing to succeed, and we're not going to change the operational plan at this stage. It's a shame you couldn't get the cartel to release some Doom Troopers to us, said the battle station's senior coordinating officer. They would have been a great help to the Special Forces. I know, but the cartel has yet to fully and officially appreciate the threat of the Dark Legion, Wood answered a rumble of irritation in his voice. Too many bureaucrats, too many diplomats meeting over so many useless things. There are Doom Trooper teams and squads who know about the threat and take it seriously. If only we could convince their superiors. Do you think the success of this attack will convince them? Hart asked. I hope it does. To borrow a Brotherhood term, this could be an awakening to the threat. We'll need a lot of information to do so, Mr. Wood. And if my advisor teams will be allowed to follow corporate protocol, we could soon be receiving reports from them. Mitch, this is Julia, approaching Citadel Outer Defense Perimeter. I see, said Hunter watching a tactical display on the main cabin's terminal. Stand by to activate shrouding system, and I want you to deactivate all radar systems, even your radar altimeter. What? Why do you want to do that? Sutter demanded, stammering out her question before Bamble could even start his. Julia and I have read enough reports on the Dark Legion, shooting down aircraft and drones to indicate they may be able to see radar better than any of our equipment. This will give us one extra advantage in penetrating their net. Mitch, this is Julia, deactivating air surveillance radar, said Alvarez. Terrain following radar, fire control radar, and radar altimeter. Jeff says he can use the laser designator as an altimeter and I'll switch over entirely to low light level and infrared systems. Good work, you two, said Hunter, switching the overhead terminal to a schematic of the cutlass, which would indicate all the systems being shut down. Don't push your airspeed any more than you have to. As it is, we're running ahead of schedule. The gunship's airspeed dropped by more than 50 miles an hour immediately afterward. In part, this was due to its climbing the northern slope of the low mountain ridge that marked the unofficial beginning of the Dark Legion territory. The nearer it got to the craggy summits, the sparser the vegetation became until they were practically barren. Captain, in light of your decisions, said Bamble, trying to peek around the terminal in an attempt to get Hunter's attention. I feel at least a brief message should be sent to the battle station so as to explain them. And since you're still outside of the Dark Legion territory, I'll point out that I still have authority to do so. You're right, Dirk. They should be explained. Hunter responded, getting shocked expressions from all of his squad, until he gave Halston a brief nod. Break out your SATCOM set. Julia, this is Mitch. Bring us to hover when we reach the summit. In the last few hundred feet of its ascent, the cutlass slowed 
until it barely crawled up the mountaintop, then came to a complete stop. In spite of the wind buffeting it, Alvarez kept it so close to the peak, its rotor wash flattened its thick patches of moss. I'm ready to transmit, said Bambo, just as his hand stopped flying over his SATCOM's keyboard. What are you doing, Captain? The Southern Aurora makes transmissions difficult, said Hunter, unlocking the main cabin's port hatch. You'll have to do yours with as little interference as possible. Just point your set out the hatch when I open it. With the press of a button, the hatch slid forward, filling the cabin with rotor wash and blade noise. Since Bamble was among the last to enter the gunship, he had the last seat on the bench and only needed to lean over slightly to clear the hatch. His attention was so focused on making the transmission and not losing his grip on the SATCOM set, he did not initially notice Halston unlocking his restraint belts. Wait! No! Bamble managed to shout before two giant hands slammed into his right shoulder and hip. Whatever he said afterward was carried away on the winds, as he was. The drop from the helicopter to the mountaintop was just over a dozen feet, enough to stun Bamble and smash the SATCOM terminal. Moments later, the hatch rolled shut and the cutlass rose higher into the air before dipping its nose and sliding down its opposite slope. By the time Bamble staggered to his feet, the aircraft had disappeared. Even the Aurora Australis cast an eerie moonlight glow over the landscape. Captain Hunter, how could you order that? Sutter raged, temporarily drowning out the laughter from the rest of the squad. Dirk could have been killed by that stunt. I insist we go back and pick him up immediately. If we go back, we'll leave you with him, Hunter said coldly his icy stare extinguishing her anger. This operation's too important for it to be jeopardized by some corporate protocol freak. I suggest for overall operational security that no transmissions be made until I authorize them. As a military advisor, it's my duty to report on the performance of Capitol's armed forces, weapons, and those we encounter. Sutter's counterattack trailed off when she finally noticed the equally frigid looks she was getting from all the other squad members. Even Wendy Levine's normally sympathetic expression had vanished. I mean, I, I understand, Captain. There's no need to make any transmissions until you clear them. Good. I know you accepted our intellectual reasons for it, said Hunter, before he hit the intercom switch. Julia, this is Mitch. How long before we reach the outer defense perimeter? Two minutes, 15 seconds at current airspeed, said Alvarez. I'm reducing our altitude to 50 meters. Just keep us slow and low, Julia. When we cross the perimeter line, activate shrouding system. Everyone, ready your safety harness rigs. Arm weapons and stand by for deployment. Mutant Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy by John Allen Price Chapter 15 End